Thanks, Damon. Um, yeah, I don't know why I got that reputation as the smartest person. I, I keep telling Bryson and uh, others uh, they need to meet more people. But that's it. Um, I've had a chance to really um, do some really interesting things in my career. Uh, currently, I'm now actually, I, I left the CISO role, and it's kind of actually part of the story here, too the tale of three CISOs. Um, but I'm now a uh, security ambassador at Jupiter One. I used to be the CISO there. Um, I used to be the chief security scientist at Bank of America. And while I was there, I had a chance to create two things that uh, hopefully you guys have heard about it in some respect or another. If you were at uh, the uh, Chris Hoff's um, keynote last year, he actually mentioned these two. He mentioned the cyber defense matrix, which I brought copies of, and I'm more than happy to give them away. Please come and see me if you want to get a copy, as well as the DIE triad. And I want to talk a little bit about those in context, but um, those are just two things that I'm generally known for. Um, <clears throat> oh, and, I, and uh, if I run out of books, um, there's a book signing that uh, if you have one of those expensive uh, business hall passes that you should really get for free, um, <clears throat> I'll do a book signing over there as well. All right. Now, as I mentioned, um, I, I don't really consider myself the smartest person in cybersecurity, and I certainly would not put myself in the category for uh, anything associated with this newfound, newfound, uh, newfangled technology. Oh, by the way, so I, I hate calling it, I hate using buzzwords. I prefer to just call it newfangled technology or NFT. And so if you hear me um, just call it that, just, just make sure you understand why I'm calling it NFT. So, okay, so <clears throat> in this uh, newfangled technology, I, I'm, I, I think I've passed the uh, peak of Mount Stupid, okay? <laughs> but I'm not that much further, okay? And so I'm sure there's people who are way, way smarter than I am, more, way more competent than I am in, uh, in, the, in this particular new space. Um, but I try to think more deeply about what are the ramifications? What are the things that we can look at um, beyond the problem space that we might be facing. And to uh, kind of go and look at what uh, Josh talked about yesterday, he kind of gave that 10-year recap. So I'm looking for 10 years. And that was kind of my role at Bank of America as the chief security scientist. I said, what kind of things should I be looking for 18 months out, three years out, uh, so that we can be prepared to uh, tackle some of the challenges that we might face? And so that's kind of the perspective I'm taking as well. But I'm, even though I said 10 years, uh, maybe I mean, it might take 10 years, but I hope it's much sooner. And for us to be prepared to be able to take on um, the opportunities that come from this is what I would like to share here. So as we look at um, what's coming, uh, it seems like we're in this dichotomous uh, time where it seems like it's the best of times and the worst of times. And if you're in security, wow, it seems like we're in the worst of times. We have. Uh, a lot of challenges with how employees use this technology, how developers are building these uh, technologies, and how attackers are weaponizing them, okay? And each of those poses um, a real challenge for us, and three, you know, three core problems that we run into. But I think, I, I'm not, not gonna spend too much time on that because I'm sure um, there's more than enough material on that, okay? And I'm not planning on sharing that piece as much, but I'll give you a little real quick snapshot of that just so you understand the context of how I'm thinking about it. But the real question is, how do we make this the best of times? How do we take the opportunities that are presented before us and really capitalize that uh, for our careers, for our industry, and what we can do going forward, okay? So what are those opportunities? And that's what I'm gonna focus on primarily. Now, as I talk about these best of time opportunities, um, you know, it's, it's somewhat pro prognosticating, okay? As I mentioned, I hope that these will come to pass, and I have, I've looked at this for a while to, to see the signs of it, and I would say, um, I, I, well, I, well, you know, I think one of the things I would look for is so, uh, key indicators that this is actually um, trying to, it's starting to happen, and I've already started to see some of these things happen. So, um, we'll see if it turns out, but uh, I hope it's not, uh, well, as I, as I predict the future for you, I hope it's not uh, too high fluting and high, too uh, ivory tower. I think there's some real practical truths that we can take away from some of these things. All right, so first, let's talk about the uh, worst of times and how employees use this newfangled technology. Well, first of all, is that we have a lot of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And as we have folks um, using these technologies, we have people saying, oh, wait, um, it seems like it's spewing out the same intellectual property that we just put in, okay? And I would say, no, no, you gotta understand this is not, that's not how it works, okay? 
That's not how LLM works. And, and the way I would characterize it is that LLMs generate, but they don't commemorate. They generate new information. They generate information, but they don't commemorate uh, information that's already in the system, unless statistically it's, it's highly prevalent. Uh, Caleb Saima actually gave a great example. If you type in, um, what is my social security number? And you give it um, the first five characters, it won't be able to figure out the remaining five, even if it was trained on, your social, on a whole bunch of social security information, okay? So the perspective that uh, LLMs generate and not commemorate is one of the uh, misconceptions, or at least people thinking that uh, we can, um, that it will spin out, you know, spit out a whole bunch of information about uh, our intellectual property. And so we're seeing a bunch of things happen in the industry for this. I was going to put a bunch of logos of companies, uh, but as you probably know, the, the curve for the number of companies being created on LLMs is like vertical. Okay, so it's, it's hard to keep up. I've, I said, you know what, it's not worth uh, trying to capture that. But there are tons of that, those technologies, and um, I was also part of a, a group that helped uh, uh, produce a policy around how should we look at these, uh, this as a concern, okay? However, that said, okay, I'm not going to uh, hit that much because you guys can, I'm sure you're already well versed in a lot of that where you can hear a lot of talks on it. But I think there's an opportunity for us to, again, uh, change the role. So change how we look at our role and the opportunities that we have. So how can we elevate the CISO role in this new, um, new, this new environment? And so and let me give you an analogy. Consider what a CFO does. What is the CFO in charge of? They are, um, they govern the wise and appropriate use of money. They allow businesses to essentially uh, spend money to basically make more money, right? So that's the whole point of businesses, right? They don't actually make money too, by the way. They don't generate money. I, I guess they can do fundraising, but that's not really creating new money. And if, uh, if a CFO said, you can't spend any money, you might as well fire them, right? They're not a really good CFO in that regard. But what if the opportunity is for us to become the CFO for intellectual property? So we have a bunch of intellectual property going out and we have these concerns around them. But it's sort of like, what if, what if again, it's a form of currency and we spin currency to make better currency? So what is, what's the role? Then we govern the wise and appropriate use of intellectual property. Uh, we allow them to spin this IP and this IP, by the way, has different, uh, you know, I don't know if I want to put a dollar value to it. I, I'm really deep, uh, well versed in the uh, cyber risk quantification space. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff around that. But I don't want to get into that. Let's just talk about it in the context of like, are we talking about low denomination bills or high denomination bills? Okay. Uh, are we talking like, if I went to a CFO and asked, hey, I want to spend $25 on something. Uh, they will come to me and say, what are, you, what are you asking me for? I'm like, just go swipe your credit card and go on. What, what is a low denomination intellectual property for us? Might I suggest, for example, our source code is low value denomination bills, okay? Do I really need to ask for permission to uh, transmit snippets of source code? Now, a lot of low denomination bills may add up to a high denomination bill, so to speak, and so we have to be, you know, figure out what, what that sort of threshold is, but the perspective is, is we have a lot of intellectual property and if I said, as a, as a CISO, you cannot spend any of that intellectual property, well, guess what? You should probably fire me, right? And so what, what if uh, we change our role and the opportunity is for us to consider what it, what it looks like to be a CFO for intellectual property? Now, with that comes actually some other interesting implications or interesting uh, concepts. And with finance and accounting, it's a very mature practice, as you, as you well know. And in that context, there is um, lots of different things that we can borrow from that as well, okay? And we don't have those tools here, but th these practices are, are things that we can probably figure out how we can adapt them to uh, security as well. And so I, I just pulled up a bunch of terms in generally accepted accounting practices. I'm gonna call them security practices. And uh, here's an example, impairment. Impairment is a financial term, okay? And I did some slight tweaking just to uh, uh, remove some of the finance specific words, but if you read it, it sounds like what we can do in security. What is impairment? It's when some sort of resource is impaired, okay, it's, it's designated as impaired 
when I can no longer have any sort of assurance that it can be fixed within a certain time frame, okay? Sound like something we deal with on a regular basis, right? Should we call it maybe impaired, okay, versus, you know, vulnerable or whatever else is? Yeah, it prob maybe, okay, and guess what? When you have the term impairment, there's also all these calculations that come into how we think about, um, like how you calculate impairment cost. Assets, we call them assets, right? It just seems natural, except assets on a balance sheet is on the positive side of the ledger. But most of the assets that we deal in security are actually more liabilities, okay? Do we actually have it on the right side of the ledger? Uh, and maybe if we start representing it as, as, a, as a liability and not as a, quote, asset, all of a sudden the business will see it as, wait, why are we carrying these liabilities not doing something about it? Maybe we should try to get rid of these liabilities, okay? So again, just slight wor uh, wording change, but you can see how that uh, helps as well. Um, survival metrics. So if, if you're in a startup or if, you, um, if you're any venture-funded company, uh, there's a whole bunch of metrics that we rely upon to see how much um, time we have before we die as a company. So they're called survival metrics. Uh, what's your burn rate? What's your runway? What's your churn? And in the context of assets and how we look at sorry, liabilities, I should say, uh, and, and the way that we look at the resources that we have to be able to uh, run a company, um, what, how, how, does, how does an impairment reduce our runway? How does an impairment increase churn? And I'm not talking about churn in customers, I'm talking about churn in other uh, ways that we think about um, how the, these digital assets work as well. Um, later on, have a, uh, later today, I have a talk on double entry accounting. So what is double entry accounting? It's a simple way to be able to have two ledgers, two different systems provide a check against each other, okay? And I'll share some examples of that later today uh, during a talk specifically on that. So I'm not gonna spend too much more time on that. And then um, uh, EBITDA, the EBITDA. There's a whole bunch, there's the industry, the finance industry has been reshaped a lot because of the simple concept of EBITDA. And we can think about like, what does it mean to have income in the context of cybersecurity? We know what the term te technical debt means, right? But how do we translate that into how it offsets this notion of income and the value that's being created by these assets that, or these assets slash liabilities that we have? See, even I, st I still keep throwing myself off in these things. But that's it. The, the pre premise here is that we have a set of practices that we can now uh, try to codify within how we do cybersecurity. And I think the reason why that is particularly important is because I've been fairly deeply concerned, and if you haven't been deeply concerned, you should, let, you should be concerned about how the government is deciding some of these things for us, okay? And whether you agree or disagree with uh, the Joe Sullivan's uh, verdict, um, I, I could put myself in his shoes, and there are many, many cases where I would have probably done similar things as he would have done, uh, maybe a few things I wouldn't have done, but nonetheless, I can see how many of us can fall into the same traps that he did. And then Tim Brown, with the Wells notice uh, that he got served, I mean, there's, there's a center of practice that they're assuming that we can't ever achieve, okay? So when we think about, um, when we think about, for example, some of these practices, let's, I'll, I'll talk about this in double entry accounting, how precise is accounting, okay? Or how accurate are, are the books? How much variance do CFOs allow? And guess what? They do allow some variance, okay? It's not a perfect, I mean, the, the, the ledgers don't always match, and yet, they don't get sued. Well, if it's a huge variance, they might. But um, within acceptable amounts, they don't get sued, they don't get fined, they don't get these issues. And it seems like that's not the same for us in cybersecurity. And so we have an opportunity to, to well, we have a couple opportunities. One is to redefine our role, not as a, uh, as a person that tries to secure, uh, as a technical weenie that tr tries to secure all these little things, but rather in this sort of governance role of how we um, manage and govern intellectual property and the institutional knowledge of the organization. And we have these tools to help us. Well, we need to come up with these tools. And in doing so, we'll end up with ways that we can potentially provide um, guidance for the government and for us as a practice so that we can not uh, deal with these in the future as well. All right, so that's the first um, best of times opportunity. How can we become the CFO for intellectual property? The second challenge that we deal with, the second problem, is developers building. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> pretty much every company out there is now and, you know, using these newfangled technologies to try to do something with 
uh, LLMs or generative AI. Um, here's a, a diagram that you can barely see because it's the wrong contrast um, that, uh, that Andreessen Horowitz uh, sent out. It's a reference architecture for how you build LLM uh, applications. And don't worry about the detail at this point, but I do want to point out a couple things that uh, in the context of uh, what we've always learned in security, there are a couple inviolable rules, right? Um, one, you know, never get into a land war of Asia, land war in Asia, but the one that's probably more important, or, well, you know, just slightly well less known, but nonetheless important is to never trust user input. And fundamentally, one of the issues with, uh, one of the fundamental flaws with LLMs, potentially a fundamental flaws, is that we can't separate out the control plane from the data plane. All right. So we know that, I mean, this is like a, such a well-known uh, uh, principle in cybersecurity, and yet when I go back to that chart, that reference architecture, everywhere that I've highlighted in blue is user input. Unsanitized user input, <laughs> okay? And it's pretty much everywhere, right? So, okay, um, are we gonna, it seems like it's gonna be a pretty bad thing if we build against this reference architecture that doesn't necessarily capture this uh, core principle of um, not trusting user input. So, uh, how do we deal with this? Again, there's, there's tons of things out there. I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on them. But just for reference, you have things like Berryville Institute's, um, uh, Berryville Institute of Machine Learning, uh, their taxonomy attacks. I, I love this particular one because it's the most straightforward, uh, structured way to think about uh, attacks against machine learning. Of course, many of y'all seen the OWASP top 10. And there's MITRE Atlas. So again, I'm not going to spend too much time on those things, but the but the perspective is that there's a lot of work that we're trying to do to 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 address this problem, which is all these places where we have um, unsanitized user input and all these attack surfaces. But I think there's an opportunity, and to be able to explain that opportunity, uh, let me let me talk about safety and security. Something that actually Josh talks about off, often as well. And by the way, there's a uh, vendor out there, Integrity that's giving out this really big uh, poster that says, safety first. And I love that because they're using the word safety. Now, if you're not sure why I think that matters, um, here's the thing. Okay, so if, if, you, if, you know, um, if you know Spanish, then the word for safety is seguridad. And the word for security is seguridad. So in Spanish, we have one word for the same thing, uh, so for two different things. In English, we have two words. And in cybersecurity, we have the same word again. So why don't we, I mean, in English, why don't we call it something different? Because we have two different things that we do, one that's called cyber safety and that one that's called cybersecurity. And if you want to understand the difference, if you want to get a sense of what the distinction is, we can apply um, other contexts. So let's take food. So when we talk about food safety, what are we talking about? We're talking about things like hygiene, compliance, inspections, good practices, uh, bill of materials, having a sense of personal responsibility. And when we talk about security, we're talk think talking about things like starvation or like where's the Ukrainian weed or the baby formula. And when we, people talk about security or rather safe um, compliance doesn't equal security, might it be because compliance is safety and safety doesn't equal security, okay? And let me give you another example. So uh, airplanes. If I'm an engineer at Boeing or at Airbus, my job is to ensure that the airplane stays up in the air, doesn't come crashing to the ground. Pretty simple, right? My job is not to dodge Russian and Chinese missiles. That is somebody else's job to make sure that the air space is free and or that, that we have airspace security, okay, which is to have the space uh, free and clear of Chinese and Russian missiles. It's not my job. Rather, it's somebody else's job, usually the, private, uh, the public sector, right? But the perspective here is that there's an activity that we do, that most of us actually do, that's actually safety oriented. Most of us do safety work, okay? And there are still some of y'all that do security work, but just be clear that we do cyber safety more than we do cyber security, okay? Uh, by the way, just real quick aside, um, seven years ago, Equifax got hit by a Chinese missile. Okay? Three years ago, uh, SolarWinds got by, hit by a Russian missile. All right? But that event seven years ago, as time passes on, that Russian missile starts to look like a bird strike. 
And that bird strike now is something that I'm responsible for. Okay? If I'm designing an aircraft, I need to make sure I can survive a bird strike. Um, but I shouldn't be able to survive, uh, uh, there should be no expectations that I can survive a missile strike, at least most, for most organizations. If you're Apple and you manufacture iPhones, you're probably building the equivalent of F-16s, and you better be able to survive Russian missiles, because guess what, you're going to get those shot at you. But nonetheless, just the perspective of, over time, a Russian missile uh, shot, or a Chinese missile shot seven years ago is going to start looking like a bird strike. And what does that bird strike look like now? Things like a software bill of materials, okay? Um, Solar winds got hit by a Ru Russian missile three years ago. What's that going to look like uh, four or five years from now? You better have your, supply, your software supply chain um, really secure because that's going to be a bird strike as well. So now, with this perspective of us focusing on safety, the opportunity for the CISO role is to think about us as the chief AI safety officer. So you think that cybersecurity is a problem today? <laughs> Guess what? Um, there's going to be a much, much bigger issue coming up. Okay? And I think that it's going to cause all the things that we're dealing with in cybersecurity to pale in comparison. And if you don't, if you're not, um, if you're not sure as to why I'm, I'm saying this, then I will recommend two books for you all to read through. One is um, Life 3.0 by Max Tetchmark, and another one's called Human Compatible by Stuart Russell, very well-known uh, researchers in the AI space, but they give a perspective of what the future holds um, where AI systems, uh, we're not, they're, we're not, the concern is not that AI systems are malevolent. The concerns are that the AI systems are competent, very competent, so competent that uh, we ask it to do something and it does it extra extraordinarily well despite um, what may violate our own value system. So for example, I would say, uh, I'm running late, take me to the airport as quickly as you can, and the, uh, this autonomous car will take me to the airport as quickly as it possibly can. I might not survive, I may kill people on the way, uh, mi minimally I may be very nauseated, okay? Which doesn't necessarily uh, adhere to my value system. So how do we design these systems so that they're built safe, um, safely and responsibly? So if you've heard all the things around uh, responsible AI, or um, even the, I think we heard earlier about the cognitive science aspect of things. This is all centered around this notion of AI safety. And who better to take on the role of a chief AI safety officer than somebody who's been doing digital safety for years and years. So, I think that the opportunity for us going forward is to say, hey, you guys need an AI safety officer? That's us. We've been doing this for a long, long time. Now, uh, now what, what does that mean to be an AI safety officer? There's a lot of uh, principles that do apply in cybersecurity, um, and we've learned some of these principles as well, and I, and I have a whole talk on this, but I'm just going to hit the highlights on this. But we've tried to do, we've applied our, um, these different newfangled technologies in security as well, tied it with automation, and have resulted in us uh, basically shooting ourselves in the foot many times over, okay? Um, and so we've taken, we, we want to take those lessons learned where we've violated principles of um, safety in some of these systems and say, okay, how can we apply this to AI systems as well? And so I offer like six principles that I put together um, that I used when I was at a um, major financial institution to figure out how do we uh, set these sort of guardrails for ourselves. As we build, this, build these systems, how do we ensure, for example, that we know exactly what sort of inputs that we're putting into it? How do we have an AI bill of materials? Um, how do we have conditions that are not unbounded but very tightly bounded? How do I know, um, how can I ensure that um, ultimately we want to make the, the system as deterministic as possible? And to make it as deterministic as possible, we try to make things as bounded as possible. We want to have thresholds when we know um, we need to either take action or not, uh, not take action. And, and by the way, the, the sort of uh, the examples I, I used in this um, when I came up with these were things like when do you block an IP address automatically? When do you have an orchestration system take action on your behalf? These are questions that I'm sure some of y'all are dealing with, and these are the kind of conditions that I put forth when I said, okay, we will fully automate this activity once this, this an analytic system figures out what's going on, okay? And so these are sort of the, uh, the guardrails that we ca came up with because we wanted to make sure that things didn't go out of control, okay? And so fundamentally, these are AI safety sort of principles, which you will learn just by 
using these technologies within the, within the context of security. So anyway, other things like just making sure that you have, uh, you understand the, the, the processes that um, are anticipated by the operators, having a kill switch, uh, and by the way, on the kill switch piece, let me mention uh, the book Human Compatible has a really great thesis on how to uh, build in a kill switch for these systems. Definitely worth uh, taking a closer look at. And then making sure that there's somebody who owns this, um, this system so that you have somebody who's accountable for making sure that it doesn't kill everybody. All right. Okay, so that's, those are the guardrails. And then lastly, um, the third one is, the third uh, challenge is attackers weaponizing. So we're going to have a lot of different ways that attackers weaponize. Some of these are, are, are pretty well known. You're going to see presumably more convincing uh, phishing attacks. You'll see people perhaps generate, uh, or the novices generate more malware. Um, but for the most part, I think those are things that, um, you know, we've already been tackling those problems and that's not too terribly new. However, I think in the context of what these technologies are going to offer is ways that we can, uh, that attackers can potentially accelerate their uh, ability to find vulnerabilities within our systems, as well as uh, novel ways to leverage things like deep fakes and so on and so forth. And so for these two uh, new types of uh, attack vectors that the attackers may uh, use to we when they weaponize these technologies, I think we should think about what those may imply. And so let me talk about those two for a moment. The first two, again, just keep doing what you're doing. It's not going to make, I don't know how much more, much more of a difference it's going to make, but that's it. I think the bottom two are ones that I would be a bit more concerned about. So with the bottom two though, there is uh, some opportunities here. And to be able to explain that opportunity, let me explain um, something called the DIKW pyramid. So DIKW stands for Data, Information, Knowledge, Wisdom. And the premise here is that each layer provides more value than the layer below. So, um, and I think for the most part, we are now into what we call, what I would call the knowledge economy. We've been at the data economy, we've been at the uh, information economy, now we're at the knowledge economy. To give you a sense of how you can lo look at this, like data might be, let's say, websites. Information would be Google. ChatGPT is at the knowledge layer. Okay, and the the premise here is that um, LLMs is, is opening up this new economy, the cognitive economy, the knowledge economy, and it will um, give us the ability to access institutional knowledge like we haven't had before. Okay, uh, to give you another sense of how this th to think about this, we've been wanting enterprise search for a long time, and it's failed because what we get back is a bunch of data and information not actual institutional knowledge, right? We get ba back a bunch of documents that, that you're supposed to process. No, I want to get you to give me the answer. I don't want you to just give me a whole bunch of documents that I have to go read through. What uh, LLMs have opened up is this knowledge economy. And with that perspective, I would offer a view that the, our understanding of how to build secure systems is already known. It's just not widely distributed. It's not evenly distributed. But what if there were a system that helped distribute this knowledge more uniformly? What if there were a mechanism by which we could have an engineer who had a business problem um, ask this engine and it spews out this, the instructions for how to build this system? Now, the engineer will never or <laughs> will rarely ask, how do I build this system securely, right? That's not really part of their equation. But we built that in as a part of the answer. Okay, and by the way, the answer not, may, not, may not necessarily be to build it more securely, but as I frame it down here, to have fewer security concerns. Okay, fewer security concerns. And the reason why I say that is because the DIE triad, if you're not familiar with that, it's a concept that I came up with called, um, uh, that stands for distributed, immutable, ephemeral. And the idea is, if I build systems to be distributed, immutable, and ephemeral, it allows us to reduce the amount of security concerns I would have. So even if the system were vulnerable, even if the system were even compromised for that matter, um, my security burden is lowered, okay? How do I build systems to either be secure by default or even better, to not require security at all? And that sort of design pattern is actually known. Some of it's not known and some, some maybe, maybe narrow edge cases, but across the industry, 
we do know that. And guess where we share it? We share it in conferences like this. Okay, we share it in um, Kub um, KubeCon and CNCF and all these other places where, where uh, people are sharing these design patterns. It's just not widely disseminated. It's, it's not easily accessible. This knowledge sits in all these videos and I have to go and pick them out myself. But what if there were a way to be able to tap that and pull that out? And so at this point, we have the mechanisms to build uh, more secure or systems that don't require security at all. It's just a question of how do you assemble this together? And so this perspective of, uh, that we saw earlier in terms of the uh, issue with vulnerabilities, what if we're able to build systems that have fewer vulnerabilities to begin with? Or systems for which even if it had a vulnerability, I didn't care. And then the second piece is around the deep fakes. And so let me, for that, I have to explain <laughs> yet another concept. Um, so again, I mentioned the cyber defense matrix earlier. I'm sure folks are familiar with the, um, or heard about the um, CISA's uh, zero trust maturity model. Um, there's five pillars, identity, devices, networks, applications, and workloads and data. There's five, function, there's five asset classes in the cyber defense matrix, devices, apps, networks, data, and users. Now, if you wonder why there's five and why those um, asset classes align pretty closely, there, there's a reason behind that. But unfortunately, some of it gets slightly misinterpreted. So let me clarify some of the misinterpretation. First of all, uh, identity is not just users, okay? That's how we people typically think of it. They think of identity as being users, and if you look at the logo, that's a user, right? That's what this is conveying. So users and identity, as far as they're looking at it, are kind of synonymous, okay? But they're not. Why? Because all these asset classes have an identity. Devices have identity. Applications have identity. Networks have identity. Data has an identity. Okay? And you're like, okay, well, I think I understand the first three, but what does it mean to have a data identity? Uh, and by the way, before I go to answer that question, I should mention, uh, oh yeah, so not all, all, all these asset classes have identity, not just users. I should mention, I, I thought it was kind of funny, um, back in 2016, I, I shared this briefing of like, where does uh, governance and analytics and, um, and uh, automation and orchestration go? And they pretty much put it under the same, same sort of view as well. So um, a lot of this was, I think, uh, pretty much inspired by some of the work I did, but there's some just slight, slight variations I wanted to correct. But that's it. Okay, let's go back to data identity. What is data identity and why is that a, why is that a problem? Well, let's go back to deep fakes. Think about deep fakes. Fundamentally, the deep fake issue is a data identity problem, okay? We have a situation where we have content, data, and I don't have a way to authenticate whether it's, well, I don't have a way to determine if it's authentic, right? Now, we've had this problem before, okay? And it's the source of all the issues that we saw earlier with this, these lures, right? It's phishing, emails, right? And we've had this trouble with email for a long, long time because, well, um, we, it's an ecosystem problem and we need an ecosystem, we need the will of all these organizations to say, we gotta fix this problem. But email, it doesn't seem like we got the will to get that done, okay? There's been a lot of efforts to try to get email to be more authenticated, but it still sucks and that's why we still have all these phishing emails and so on that are effective. But there's a bigger problem that's emerging, a much bigger problem. And it's one that is of societal concern, meaning there are people who care about this beyond this room, okay? People outside of the security community. And because it's a bigger, deeper concern, I believe that the will to fix it is going to be coming up, okay? So what would this look like? Perhaps it's a situation where the ecosystem says, hey, you know what? If you take a picture with a device that has a um, certificate on it, signed by a major manufacturer, then I can uh, validate that this picture was taken by this piece of hardware and it's been unadulterated, okay? And you've seen already uh, where places where people have tagged it to say this is AI generated, but what I'm looking for is something that says, no, this is authentic, right? And I'm looking for authentic video, I'm looking for authentic uh, photos, I'm looking for authentic audio. Now, if I solve that problem, what is email, right? I mean, that's trivial. Email is trivial compared to video, audio, images, okay? And if, they can, if we can find a way to solve that problem, might we get rid of 
the bigger problem that we've had, we, that we've had in security for such a long time. And so that's, I think that's the perspective to look for in the future, which is with the bottom one, you have fewer systems, uh, systems built with fewer security concerns and then the bottom one being where even email becomes a trivial, uh, a, a, we can solve the, the authenticated email problem which really gets rid of some of the problems above as well. All right, so to wrap up, I think the best of times for number three is not elevating the role but eliminating the role. How do we eliminate the role of the CISO? Because I think if we have a way to build systems with fewer security concerns, if we have a way to solve some of the thorniest problems that we've had in security, well, you know, my job as a CISO may not necessarily be as important anymore. And so I would love to have this role shrink. And what's interesting is uh, Ryan McGeehan, he's a, uh, he used to work at Netflix, he's an advisor to a lot of startups, and he states that there's a lot of security companies, I'm sorry, not security companies, there's a lot of uh, new companies that don't even need a CISO because they've already uh, built systems that don't require, that have a much uh, lower reduced risk profile. And that's partly because they build against the DIE triad that you saw before, but I think it's also because, again, they're building against better design patterns. And so I think the opportunity for us is to look at, so as our job goes away, we have other opportunities. And one is to become the CFO for intellectual property, and the other one is to be the chief AI safety officer. So with that, thank you very much. Take any questions. Hello, hello. Okay, great. Uh, we have time for questions. Thank you for the talk. One, one last thing. Be very. We're going to move this back away from that projector because it's got a bad leg, and if you touch it, it's going to fall over and go back. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. I have a nuanced uh, question in the spirit of deliberately feeding Roko's Basilisk, and your presentation seemed to focus primarily on the business um, user, the engineer the technologist, but my question is really for you on this room. How, how do you change or amend these principles with the dark, sweet embrace from the security enterprise professional deliberately using LLM for the purposes of security? And when we're making decisions around information that's coming out of LLM for security purposes, how do we need to be thinking about building our own tools and our own practices for InfoSec and not just thinking of that sort of us and them towards the uh, user, towards the business uh, um, aspect and towards the uh, developer and engineer? Sure, great question. So let me answer it in two ways. First is the, the business alignment. Um, you're spot on in terms of the way I'm characterizing the future role is highly business aligned. And that's been a flaw of how we thought about security for a long time, that we didn't, we weren't business aligned. So the real goal, as I see it in the future, is for us to be highly business aligned. That said, we are here today, and we're dealing with, um, we're, we're trying to leverage these technologies to, to deal with the present problems, uh, the problems of the present. And so I, I did mention this as a way that we can think about uh, how we leverage some of the technologies and what sort of safeguards we can put in. The other question, there was another facet to your question is, how are security teams using LLMs today? Okay, and I deliberately skipped that question because um, I, spend, I, I, spend times, I, I spend time with startups talking to startups about what they do, and I, I haven't run into a single one that isn't using LLM in some way to help address our security problem. So um, I, I deliberately skipped that question because I, I, we're just, I'm inundated by that. I don't know if you guys are but nearly every startup I talk to has something associated with that. So uh, if you want to get more specific details, I'm happy to share that because I've been, I have a lot of it in my head. I just didn't think it was worth spending time on here because really just go out to any vendor out there and, and they'll tell you. Good to see you again. Good seeing you. 
Um, there's an industry effort um, in the font industry, Monotype, Adobe, Microsoft, etc., around authenticity. And we're, we're building a standard around it because it's a problem that needs to be solved for the benefit not only of just the font industry, but uh, larger industries. Um, I would encourage everybody in this room to research about standards emerging regarding authenticity and to start checking around the problem of how you validate authenticity independent of authentication. They are separate problems that require independent solutions. And authentication is a path towards validating authenticity, but not the only one. Hmm. And and it's, I'm not just splitting hairs here. The differences of concepts matter. And solving the problem of authenticity um, is one of the biggest problems we have to solve in order for our profession to thrive, much like solving the issue of control or utility remain unsolved problems and undiscussed problems in our industry. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can uh, understand the semantic difference. I, I think I have some sense of the semantic difference between authenticity and authentication. Um, so we can have a sideline uh, yes. side discussion on that. I think fundamentally what the pr premise I would still offer is that I, I, would, I would push forward the notion that we know how to solve the problem, we just haven't uh, built up the will to solve the problem, even if it's to say, you know what, we're just going to create a de facto standard to do this, right? And whether you're Apple or Microsoft or Google, they can, they can do something that will drive that, uh, that sort of adoption, even if we ended up with two or three different ways to, to do it. Yeah. And it's, it's in the works, it is happening. Thanks for your talk. Um, so I'm more worried about um, veracity as, instead of authenticity. Um, so you know, I'm sure you're aware of the case lately where um, uh, AI generated a legal brief, mm -hmm. had eight different, eight different uh, case fake laws cases. cited yep. that were fake cases that made them out, out of whole cloth. I've had conversations with it with, where it tries to convince me of stuff that I know personally didn't happen. Um, what kind of guardrails do you envision around those kinds of things? Because I see us, kind, it, it, it's like it wants to appease us, so it's going to give us the answers and the words that we want to hear. Yeah. But there's not any real good way for us to authenticate the, the, the rat veracity of it right now. Nobody's even thinking about that problem, I don't think. Are they? Um, so, I have a model for that. Oh, good. Uh, it's called the uh, EIKW Pyramid. So, L LLMs are offered at the knowledge level. And what sits above it? Wisdom, <laughs> right? And so I think there's a, uh, and we don't have a machine that will go and apply that wisdom. So, um, that's still up to us to apply that wisdom on top of whatever anyone shares with us, right? So, I'm sharing to you knowledge. I expect you to take your wisdom engine and discern whether or not what I'm telling you is, um, uh, has the veracity that you're looking for, right? So that's something to consider. Um, by the way, on the, on the topic of hallucinations, uh, there's a wonderful case that you should read about uh, with this girl who was undergoing uh, open brain surgery and she was conscious at the time the neuro neurosurgeon zapped her brain. She started to laugh. The neurosurgeon asked, why did you laugh? We know the answer, but she looked, so based on the sensory input that she was getting, her brain made a statistical guess as to what was the cause. And the cause was, oh, it's because of what you're wearing, or zap. It's because of the photo on the, on the wall, or zap, or it's because of something. In other words, her brain was hallucinating, statistically. Fascinating story. But anyway, all right. Uh, how do you see organizations addressing data compliance with AI? Because not only are you dealing with the challenge uh, now of users willingly giving up IP and information to public sources, thinking that they're helping the company, you're not just fighting rogue actors that may be exfiltrating data. So how do you see companies thinking about this differently because currently it's still a fight to get people to maintain compliance and think about data compliance. Um, even industries that fall under SEC, FINRA, um, you know, FDA, Part 11 stuff, those orgs really, you know, they, they fight compliance on that as much as they can because they feel like it hinders operations in the business. So I'm just curious how you see AI, cha or AI changing that or whether or not that's something you think is actually going to change or if it's going to be the same fight with a new thing. 
Yeah, it, it's fundamentally a different type of problem. So let me explain why. So data governance, information governance, knowledge governance. Okay. Uh, let's look at access controls. Knowledge, uh, data access controls, information access controls, knowledge access controls. Data access controls can be done at a very discrete level. You have access to this document, you have access to this database, this row, whatever, yes or no. Very binary. No, uh, information is, a little, is more abstract. It's confidential. What, what, is, what, what do you mean by confidential? Like, what's the specific thing that's confidential, right? Uh, or secret or top secret or whatever. Um, th this perspective of abstracted data is where information op uh, operates. And what is information governance at that scale? It's a little bit more intangible, right? Then you have knowledge, which is even more abstract and intangible. Um, so, and, and we've seen this already happen with LLMs that seemingly uh, take copyright, uh, reproduce copyrighted material, right? By the way, we, in our conversations, rep reproduce copyrighted material all the time, and we don't cite the sources. It's, it's called education, okay? And so how do we know uh, what the sources are? I and mean, we, we can't, actually, because it's so, from so many different pieces of, inf uh, from so many pieces of data and information that gets assimilated into this notion of knowledge. So it is a, it's a whole different problem. Um, and and I'm sure, I don't think I can give you the answer because I don't know the answer, but I, I can pose the, the, the entirely different nature of the problem itself. Thank you. Um, separating the AI for a moment, your v vision of a chief intellectual property, you know, like CFO alternative is nice for trade secrets and intellectual property, but an entire new branch of officer is the chief product security officer for the things you put into the world. Or in OT and ICS environments, it's availability and cyber physical safety roles for CISO. So have you put some of these models to product security and operational cyber physical system security, their futures and their evolutions, or is this a fork in the tree of a CISO? Uh, the view that I would have is whatever you're building, um, whatever you're building, if, there, if the understanding of how to build, for example, a uh, more, either more secure or a system that doesn't require security at all, IT system, OT system, ICS system, whatever else it is, um, I, again, I would postulate, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, but that is known. It's a known quantity. Is that a fair? Is that a fair statement? It's less mature. Well, I I don't disagree, but somebody knows. Oh, this is how you should build a system that is not just uh, secure or doesn't require security at all, but rather also works with the business. It actually achieves the business goals. Okay. How do we get that knowledge more widely disseminated? Write a book about it. <laughs> or have something that allow, uh, that taps that understanding, right? And that's what I think the future holds. Now that understanding has to be properly verified that it's that is correct, okay? Uh, but nonetheless, we have a we have a leg up now in being able to say, okay, here's a design that may actually be the better design. Thank you, sir, for doing this. Huge fan. You know, one of the criticisms I've heard in both the professional world and the education world is that LLMs will give false answers. And my response is always, well, I get told the wrong thing every day, uh, <laughs> you know, without LLMs. Going back to your DIKW model, I'm curious, you know, one of the things that I've seen is where there's a masking of ignorance, where suddenly an analyst who wasn't super smart yesterday is suddenly an expert in his field. Where do you see organizations, like what are some safeties or guardrails or, or ways to expose where we might have these false flag experts who really don't truly understand the material, but because of this introduction of new knowledge and being able to basically have a tutor on demand, to, which I'm all for, by the way, but you know this, this kind of hiding of ignorance and subterfuge of expertism, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I don't know, if there's a, I don't know where the solution's gonna emerge. Sure. Um, perhaps it's sort of like, uh, if, I, if, I wanna, if I wanna teach um, if I want to teach my kids well, then am I going to fill them with a whole bunch? Of, will I give them access to the internet and YouTube and say, go learn from there? Or will I say, will I have a curated set of content that I know to be true, 
right? That this is verified by scientists, by um, people who've actually like, you know, there, there's, and there may be disagreement, right? Not, I'm, not dis, I'm not saying that there's a disagreement sure. on things, but the perspective of, you know, this is foundational knowledge that everyone should have, okay? Train up on that, right? Uh, and that's what we would try to, that's what we, we kind of need to do. It goes back to an earlier point I made around the, uh, the sources, right? So if we want to have, um, uh, like this AI bill of materials is something that we're actually trying to figure out, like how do we establish that? Because I don't want that to include poison. Sure. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. So anyway, hopefully that answers your question. I don't know how we purge it sure. yet, but that's, that's the premise. I'm here to thank you for your talk and um, say it's time to move on to the next one. All right, cool.